the Commodore VIC-20 was a big hit with consumers, and they could have just continued making that computer and reaped the profits for years. But instead, they did what any good technology company should have done, they kept innovating. The VIC chip, which was at the heart of the VIC-20's graphics and sound production, was to be upgraded. This would be accomplished by splitting the chip into separate sound and video chips, which would be known as the VIC-2 and the SID, or sound interface device. The new video chip would offer higher resolution, bitmap graphics modes, 8 hardware sprites, a full 16 colors, raster interrupts, uh, smooth scrolling, and DRAM refresh. Well, the refresh feature has nothing to do with video specifically, it does allow any computer using this chip to move to the cheaper dynamic RAM instead of the expensive static RAM used in the VIC-20. As for upgrades to the sound, the new chip would have three voices. That may seem like a downgrade from the VIC-20's four voices, but these voices are much more versatile as all three voices are independently programmable with four waveforms to choose from, and a programmable ADSR envelope, eight octave range compared to the three octaves of the VIC voices, uh, filters, and then a few other oddities uh, like a random number generator and two analog to digital converters that can be used for paddles or whatever accessories they might come up with. Of course, these upgrades were not intended for the VIC-20 itself, as these changes would make existing software incompatible with the computer. However, Commodore clearly saw that games were in fact one of the biggest selling points of the VIC-20, so they decided to use these chips to create a new gaming system called the Commodore Max. Or in some markets it was called the Ultimax. Now, I can only show you pictures of these because I've tried for ages to get my hands on one, but they're very rare. Uh, the Max, while it looks like a computer, is really just a gaming machine. It only has 2K of internal RAM and doesn't even include BASIC. The keyboard is mostly for show. Being a membrane keyboard, it was very difficult to type on. The reason these machines are hard to find is that the product was pretty much dead on arrival. Very few were sold, and most sales that did occur were in Japan. And while the Max had superior graphics and sound, the VIC-20, it sold for around $200, which at that time was the going price of the VIC-20 as well. And the VIC-20 had a much larger software library, a real keyboard, integrated BASIC, and the ability to connect to disk drives and all sorts of things. So it became obvious what needed to happen. The Max was upgraded with essentially the same case and keyboard as the VIC-20, along with integrated BASIC and a full 64K of memory, and they called it the Commodore 64. Opening the box, we see, Welcome to the world of friendly computing, just like the VIC-20 had on its box. We get a similar manual, which I'll get into later, uh, then of course there's the computer itself. There is some debate as to what color you would call this computer. Some call it gray or charcoal, others call it brown. And this may actually be due to the fact that the computer will actually turn brown when exposed to UV light or heat, much like white or beige computers will turn yellow. And so when somebody says they have a brown C64, it is quite possible they do. Inside this little cubby you get a power brick, an RF switch box, and a few other cables. The C64 looks remarkably similar to the VIC-20. In fact, it uses the exact same keyboard mechanism and they are interchangeable between the two computers. The C64 actually does sit ever slightly lower, so the cases aren't identical. Looking at the side, you'll see they use the same power port, although earlier model VIC-20s did have a different port. The power switch is the same, but you may notice the VIC-20 has a single joystick port, but the Commodore 64 has two. Looking at the rear, you will also notice many similarities. Both machines have the same user port and they are compatible with the same peripherals. Keep in mind the Commodore user port was introduced all the way back on the PET. Both have the same cassette drive port, and again, this port dates all the way back to the PET and is compatible across all three machines. Both machines have the same disk drive and printer port, and the monitor port is mostly compatible. However, if you recall, the VIC-20 had to use an external RF modulator. However, by making the cartridge port smaller, they were able to make room for an internal RF modulator on the Commodore 64. Other similarities between the machines is that they share an almost identical kernel and basic 2.0. Speaking of kernel, every time I post a picture with the word kernel spelled like this, I'm flooded with comments and emails telling me that I spelled it wrong. However, just to set the record straight, Every piece of Commodore documentation spells it kernel, uh, K-E-R-N-A-L, and uh, this is the official name of their operating system. The Commodore 64 offered a great upgrade path for existing VIC-20 users. Even though the software library was not compatible, most all of the peripherals were. 
So if you had invested in a great setup like this, you could simply replace the computer itself and still keep all of your existing joysticks, disk drives, cassette drive, and printer. In fact, if you wanted to use some VIC-20 software again, it only took a few seconds to connect the VIC-20 back to the setup. So now that I've covered all of the ways that the Commodore 64 is like the VIC-20, let's talk about the ways that it is different. Powering up the old VIC-20, you get a friendly screen with nice contrasting colors, huge letters, and a message telling you that you are running Commodore BASIC version 2, which is essentially rebranded Microsoft BASIC, and you have a whopping 3.5 kilobytes free. Granted, with a memory expansion, you might see a number as high as 28 kilobytes. However, with starting up the Commodore 64, everything is very blue. <laughs> the text is much smaller, and you're informed the computer is still using BASIC version 2, and that it is a 64K RAM system, which was really a lot of RAM in 1982 for a home computer. And then a mysterious message that there is only 38K free. I'll explain this discrepancy later. However, needless to say, 38K was a lot of RAM for BASIC, and considerably more than the VIC-20 could have, even with the highest RAM expander available. One thing I always disliked about the startup colors of the C64 is that there isn't as much contrast as I'd like, so I had a ritual that I started almost on day one, where I would press CTRL-2 immediately after startup, which changes the text color to white, before I would do much of anything on the computer. I understand this was common with quite a few people, as the white text was much easier to read, especially on a CRT. And the Commodore 64 behaves exactly like the VIC-20, with the same eight colors available on the keys that can be used with the control key. However, on the 64, you could also use the Commodore key in conjunction with these keys and get access to an entirely different set of colors, thus giving access to the full 16 colors. So while the VIC-20 could essentially support two types of displays, a television connected with the RF modulator or a composite monitor, the Commodore 64 actually supports four different types of displays. So as mentioned earlier, you have the RF output for television along with the channel selector switch. Much like the VIC-20, this was probably the most commonly used display in the early days of the Commodore 64, requiring one of these little antenna switcher boxes and then requiring you to tune your television to channel three or four. The picture quality with this method ranged anywhere from terrible to tolerable. Sometimes you could get a better picture on one channel or the other. But you could also connect a dedicated monitor to this port here, just like on the VIC-20. And taking a closer look at the monitor port, the early 64 models only had five pins, just like the VIC-20. One pin for ground, one for audio, and one for composite video. However, this configuration is very rare and only the earliest C64s had this setup. Most C64s you'll find will have these extra pins on the port as well. And with these, you get an extra pin for monochrome video output along with a separate chrominance pin. Now, here's how that works. If you connect up to a monitor or television that has a composite input, then you'll get a much cleaner signal. Of course, this looks slightly better in person than it does on camera due to the way the refresh works as well as the polarized nature of the sensor in my camera. So this cable here is designed to be used with a monochrome monitor, and it feeds off that special monochrome pin. And if I try connecting this to my television, it gives a really weird looking picture. The TV still thinks it's a color signal for some reason, but the colors just go nuts with the text looking rainbow. But the computer isn't actually sending any color information. However, if you get an old monochrome monitor like this one, it's not designed to even look for a color signal, and so the picture is nice and sharp. And this configuration would not be great for gaming, although many people used black and white televisions or monochrome monitors like this back in the day because they were cheap. And the last type of monitor I want to show is what is called an LCA. Notice this cable has three connections. One of them is audio, and the other is monochrome, or what we would call luminance signal. And the other is chrominance, which carries the color information. And if you had a Commodore 1702 monitor, which was the monitor to have with your Commodore 64, you'll notice on the rear it has three jacks. One for audio, one labeled luma, and the other labeled chroma. Fortunately, they are color coded, so these just plug in like so. And if you think this setup sounds familiar, then you're right. In 1987, the world was introduced to something called S-Video for high-end Super VHS players. And if you look at the pin diagram of an S-Video cable, you'll see that, in fact, it is the same thing, just in a different style of connector. 
In fact, it's possible to build adapter cables. And what I have here is an adapter cable I built, uh, which has the Commodore LCA connection on one side and S-Video on the other. And this will allow me to connect this 1702 monitor up to an S-Video source, such as a DVD player, for example. And uh, you can also build the opposite of this, which will allow you to connect the Commodore 64 up to an S-Video capable television. So um, Commodore may have been the first company to introduce the public to the concept of S-Video, even though they didn't call it that. So, how does it look? It actually looks great, if only my camera would cooperate better. To give you a better comparison, here's a screenshot from the RF modulator. Here's a screenshot on the same television using composite. And you should be able to see the signal is cleaner, but not really any clearer. And uh, then here's the monochrome output. And while it's not colorful, it is very clear. And last, here's the LCA output. Please ignore the weird color banding in the background. This is not visible in person. It's a moir effect due to the polarization of my camera combined with the type of shadow mask in this monitor. So you'll just have to take my word that you can't see that in person. But look at the sharpness of the pixels in the text as compared to the other modes. One of the main selling points of the Commodore 64 was of course its 64K of RAM. But how did it accomplish this when the VIC-20 could not? For one thing, cost was greatly reduced by going with dynamic RAM instead of static RAM. And the refresh circuitry was provided by the new VIC-2 chip. But that doesn't explain everything. Let's have a look at the 6502 processor for a moment. There's 40 pins on this package. Now I'm not going to go into detail on each one, but I will mention these pins here. This is the data bus. This is where numbers are sent and received between different chips on the board. You'll notice there are 8 of them, hence why this is considered an 8-bit computer. With 8 bits of data, you can use numbers anywhere from 0 to 255. That's the largest number you can create with only 8 bits of data. Now, these bits here, labeled A0 to A15, are the address bus. This is where the processor says to the rest of the computer which piece of memory it wants to read or write to. Notice that there are 16 pins. If you do the math, the largest number you can create is 65535. Or in terms of memory, that's 64K since kilobytes are actually 1024 bytes each. And this is the reason the CPU can access only 64K of memory total. So you might think the memory map would look something simple like this. But keep in mind that uh, even ROM is still a form of memory. So the Commodore 64 also has 8K of kernel ROM, 8K for basic, 4K for the character set, and another 4K for I.O. space. So that presents a problem because now there's 88K of memory to access. There are a variety of solutions to this problem, many of which can be accomplished with external circuitry. However, since Commodore owned their own chip fab, they decided a cheaper solution was just to make some minor modifications to the 6502 processor. So if you notice, these three pins labeled NC mean they are no connect. They don't actually do anything. And these three pins here are ones that Commodore felt weren't necessary either. So they took those off, freeing up six pins total. So introducing the 6510 CPU, a custom CPU just for the Commodore 64. The pins are slightly rearranged and you might notice there are these six new pins here. These pins are mapped to memory address zero and are used to control banking. So there are all these other little sections of RAM that can be swapped for ROM or other things as needed. The default configuration on boot up looks like this. And this area here is the largest contiguous area of RAM and that's where BASIC winds up having access to 40K of memory. And that explains why when you go to the boot screen that there's only 38K free. And while you'll often hear me say that the Commodore 64 has a 6502 processor, Technically it doesn't, but the chip that it does have is completely compatible with the 6502 processor, so from a programming perspective, it's exactly the same. Let's talk about the graphics capabilities. There were essentially four modes of operation. You had text mode where you could use the standard character set or redefine the character set. And this works more or less exactly like it did on the VIC-20. But with the 64, we also get a bitmap graphics mode. And of course, both modes have a high res and a multicolor option, giving us the four different modes. So looking at the screen here, I'll mention that you cannot actually define a color of a specific pixel on the Commodore 64. The screen acts very much like a monochrome screen, but there are these character cells, and within each cell you can define foreground and background colors. This may seem obvious when you're in text mode, however, graphics mode works exactly the same way. This game here, for example, operates in high-res bitmap graphics mode. If I overlay this little grid showing where the character cells are, you'll never be able to find any one cell that has more than two colors in that cell. And the programmers had to work around this limitation the best they could. And here are some other examples of high-res artwork.
However, if you cared more about color than you did detail, you had the option of multicolor mode, such as this game. In this mode, the pixels are twice as big, but you also get twice as much color. You can have four colors per cell. And this allowed for some really colorful artwork to be created. Here are some other great works of art that operate in multicolor mode. Of course, that's not the limit of the C64's graphics because it also has hardware driven sprites. And there's no better way to show you how these work than the Commodore 64 user's manual. The user's manual isn't quite as good as the one that came with the VIC-20, but it's still pretty good. And it has an entire chapter on how to program sprites. And they give an example program for creating a single monochrome smiley face sprite. So I've typed in this program so we can see what it does. All it really does is define the sprite and then move it across the screen like this. And then the program ends. One of the things you'll notice when I list the program is that it stays right there. In fact, I can even cursor over here and try to type over it. It has no effect, even if I use the backspace. The sprite is totally independent of the rest of the screen. So let me show you some other things you can do with the sprite, such as change its color. It can be any of these 16 colors, and there are even multicolor sprites that can have up to four colors. You can also overlay sprites on top of each other to add more color if needed. I will also point out that the sprite doesn't care about the color cells. Its colors are totally independent of that too. So this makes them very handy for moving objects that cross the boundary of color cells. Another thing we can do is change the size. Uh, this register will make it double height and uh, this register here will make it double width. And if I want to move the sprite, I can put in a new horizontal coordinate or even a new vertical coordinate. So that's how sprites work. Sprites were an important part of Commodore 64 games as it made coding things that move much easier. In fact, just to show you what a difference they make, check out the VIC-20 version of Qbert. <laughs> it's terrible. Yet uh, the Commodore 64 version looks as good as the arcade. And you can pretty much give most of that credit to the hardware sprites. The sound interface device, otherwise known as the SID chip in the Commodore 64, was revolutionary as far as computer sound was concerned. I can safely say that in 1982, no other computer or video game system had a sound chip as sophisticated as the one in the Commodore 64. In fact, most other computers at the time, uh, like the IBM PC and the Apple II, could only produce simple beeps. In fact, I don't even think Commodore realized uh, how advanced the chip was in the early days. Most of the early games released in 1982 simply used the SID chip for some sound effects. Probably the first program to really exploit the SID chip for music was Commodore's own Christmas demo released in 1982. By the next year, many games started to incorporate musical tracks. Games like Mule just assigned each voice to be one instrument and then they stayed that way for the duration of the song. And to be honest, this sounded pretty cool in 1983 compared to what you'd hear on most computers. But then after another year or so, musicians started figuring out that they could dynamically reassign voices to different instruments as the music played, which creates the illusion of more than three voices. This becomes more apparent if you listen to these songs one voice at a time. Also, many games started to take advantage of the SID chip's ability to play digital samples. Alright, so that about wraps it up for this episode of Commodore History. However, I'm not done talking about the Commodore 64 just yet. Um, in fact, in this episode, I pretty much just told you the origins of the computer and what the hardware is capable of. In the next episode, I'm going to show you how the Commodore 64 scene evolved over the following 10 years. And I think you'll find that just as interesting. So stick around for that, and thanks for watching.